I'm so glad to see y'all. It gets old just preaching to a phone uh, each and every week, but uh, we've okay. been on YouTube, and I hope that you have benefited from that. hope God has spoken to you through that, but we're going to be in Malachi chapter 3. We're going to focus really on one verse today. There's one pastor that uh, shares a story from his life. He says, when I was 18, I had a summer job in Washington State, the apple capital of the world. He says, I was working in an orchard. And aside from having planted a green bean back during kindergarten vacation Bible school, that was the extent of my agricultural experience. But it was a wonderful summer, he said. I, I learned an entire lot, a, a lot of things. I spent a, my days moving the irrigation pipes to the next row of trees. I would help thin out clusters of the apples on, on each branch so that bigger fruit would have room to grow. And I would haul equip, equipment from one place to the next. And part of my job description included driving a tractor, and he said, I really enjoyed that. It was a great job, and I loved every minute of it. However, he says, I want you to know that doing back-breaking work in the summer sun from sun up to sundown, six days a week, convinced me more than ever that I know I was called to preach. I, I can identify with that. He says, I most remember the transformation that I saw take place in that orchard throughout the season." And when I arrived in the spring, the trees had just begun to show signs of life. They were almost bare, with just leaves on the branches. But very soon, there were little baby apples that appeared. They were small, they were green, and they were hard as, as pebbles. And as the summer began to wear on, he said, the fruit began to grow, and it began to ripen, and it changed colors, uh, first to a pinkish rose, and then with the early frost, to a bright red color. And eventually the trees became so full that some of the branches came, uh, had to be propped up with sticks in order to keep them from breaking under the weight of those apples that had become so heavy. And then he said, finally, the harvest came. And suddenly the fruit for which most of the season had been too bitter to eat, it was now ripe and it was ready to go. And there was a team of migrant workers and, and myself, and we would work all day. We would work well into the night. We picked thousands and thousands and thousands of apples, and we would gather them in these huge wooden barrels to be prepared to take to market. He said, later, after it was all over and I had finished my work experience, I remember thinking how the whole summer had been such a, a blind adventure for me. And along the way, I had no idea at that time what was happening and why we were doing what we were doing until the harvest finally came. He said, but the orchard owner, he knew exactly what we were doing and why we were doing it. He knew all along that the harvest was coming. Everything he had done during that entire year had been done to get ready for the harvest. During the previous February, long before I was hired to work on the crew, he said, when the trees were still covered with snow, he had hired some day laborers and some, some teenagers from the local high school to come part-time, and, and they pruned the branch of each and every one of those trees so that they could bear more fruit. And he spent all winter getting the trees ready for spring. And then he says in the spring, he got the trees ready for summer. And in the summer, he got the trees ready for fall. And in the fall, he cashed in, big time. Tons of apples and tons of dollars. This pastor said when he was young, that he, I went to this apple orchard owner's house a few times, and all I could say is that over the years, the apple harvest had been very, very good to this man. Now, folks, that's what you call a harvest. In the book of Galatians, and, and we're going to reference that, but in the book of Galatians, Paul gives us a promise from God upon which you and I can base every day that we live. He says this in chapter 6, verse 9. Listen carefully. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. You know, a lot of people are ready to give up today, aren't they, in the world in which we live these words that Paul wrote apply to every one of us here this morning. You will reap a harvest if you don't give up. It doesn't matter what your situation is. Now think about this. For some of us here this morning, it may seem like February. 
You know what I'm talking about? Where your branches are bare and they're covered with snow. And even what little that you have left keeps getting pruned away. You think, I don't think I can take any more losses in my life. I want you to know this morning, based on the authority of the Word of God, that the harvest is coming. Or you may be seeming like it's late August where your branches are, are just uh, about to break from all the weight of all of your responsibilities and all of your opportunities in life right now. Life is so busy. And sometimes you seem like you're just getting to the place of being absolutely overwhelmed. I want, and you're thinking in your mind, how much longer can I continue on with this? How much longer can I hold on? I want you to know that the harvest is coming. And many others are here this morning are somewhere in the middle where you'll see a little bit of progress here and then maybe a little bit of progress there. But it's not enough. Not yet. And you find yourself asking in your deepest part of your heart, will I ever be able to enjoy the fruit of my labor? I want you to know that the harvest is coming. So no matter which season you're facing right now, the harvest is coming. And when I say the harvest is coming, I'm talking about the abundant blessing of God in every area of your life. So do not grow weary in well-doing. And listen to me this morning, friend. Don't even think about giving up. Don't ever let that consider your mind, come across your mind because the harvest is coming. God's Word says that. We just need to make sure that we're prepared for it. So for this reason, this morning, we're beginning a new series entitled Ready for the Harvest. And this series is based on the principles of the law of the harvest that Paul talks about in Galatians 6. And it's also based on a message from the book of Malachi in chapter 3. And it has a, Malachi has a lot to say about getting ready to receive God's greatest blessings, the abundant living that we're talking about. So if you have your Bible, if you've already done that, let's turn to Malachi. It's chapter 3. Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament. Malachi 3 is the next to the last chapter in the Old Testament. So if you can't find it, just go to Matthew and go back to the left a couple of pages. You'll find it there. Now, a little bit of a historical context. Malachi was written by the prophet Malachi. It was written a little more than 400 years before the birth of Christ. And if you've ever read Malachi, and I'm sure most of you have, it's a very serious book in which we see several charges that Malachi makes against the people of Israel. Why is that? It's because they've been living in disobedience to the laws of God. They had not taken the sacrifices that they were to make very seriously. They had, had married uh, people from other nations and they had, had brought into the worship pagan gods into their families and into their cultures. You know what you call that today? Multiculturalism. When you bring other gods into your life. They had refused to pay their tithes. Very famous passage there in Matthew cha or Malachi chapter 3. A lot of preachers used that talking about tithing. They had also, think about this, they had also talked bad about God and disrespected Him. And yet they were always asking for God's help. But they still were stu too stubborn to change their ways. You know, that reminds me of another country that I'm pretty familiar with. You ever heard of it? It's called the United States of America, isn't it? We want God's blessings, but we don't want to be obedient to Him. We don't want to do it God's way. We want to live life without any kind of, of consequences. Just do whatever we want to do, but we want God to bless us. Friend, i got news for you. It doesn't work that way. And Malachi encountered that with the nation of Israel. So Malachi came along with this message saying, these are the areas in which you have wandered from the paths of righteousness. But that wasn't the extent of his message. He wasn't just saying... You people are bad. I mean, you're a bunch of rotten, sneaking sinners. That wasn't it. No, he took it a step further. He said, these are the areas in which you've gotten off track. And here's how you can get back on track. Here's how you can do it. So the heart of Malachi's message is that even though you have sinned, God is ready to forgive you. And he's ready to receive you back into fellowship with him. And he's ready to bless you abundantly. And he actually sums up the entire book in chapter 4. It's in verse 2. He says this, The Son of Righteousness, that's S-U-N, not S-O-N, but the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in its wings, and you will go out and leap like calves released from the stall. You ever seen about a two or three week old baby calf? Boy, they can get frisky, can't they? They can jump, as my granddaddy used to say, they can rip and snort just have a good time and, and frolic. And that's what the Bible says that we can be like. 
This is the offer that God extends to his people. An abundance of blessings and healing and leaping. Yes, leaping. I've, I've shared with you some of you this morning, I, last week or so, I've been having back issues. And I don't feel a lot, really like leaping, do you? Anybody, anybody here this morning, uh, if you're under 18, did you feel like leaping? Probably not many of us. But this is what the Bible talks about. He's talking about having energy and enthusiasm and zest for life. That's the harvest that God promises His people. And by His people, I mean everyone, you and me and everyone who calls on His name. In other words, this promise, this blessing, this abundant living is not for everybody. You know, I think that we in America, and I'm talking about all American citizens, kind of think we have this, we are entitled to receive God's blessings. That we should do it because, you know, we have this uh, idea that there's this cosmic uh, being out there and, and he loves us and we ought to have things right go in our life. Listen, it's only for the people who call on the name of the Lord. That's what Malachi says. So the question comes to our mind, how do we get there, preacher? How do we get that abundant blessing? How are we able to, to frolic and to have this zest for life that Malachi is talking about? Well, we need to learn a lesson from the owner of the apple orchard. If you want to experience a harvest, every, listen, every day you move in a harvest direction. There's a phrase in this verse that that's God speaks in Malachi chapter 3. And we're going to focus specifically on this single phrase. And it says to this, verse 7, the last part of verse 7, look at it. Return to me, and I will return to you. Say that with me this morning. Return to me, and I will return to you. Isn't that amazing? Do you know what he's saying to each and every one of us? He's saying this. Listen carefully. Think about the direction your life is taking. Think about where you're headed. And if you're not headed my way, God says, turn around and return to me. There are three principles that I want to share with you this morning. I want you to pick up. They're very simple and, and they're very obvious. Here's the first one. Your direction determines your destination. Now, that's not, that's not rocket science, is it? But we kind of forget that from time to time. This is a principle that you and I cannot escape in life. If you get on I-65 and you head south, where are you going to end up? Well, eventually, you're going to end up in the Gulf of Mexico, right? If you keep going into the water. Because where you're headed is where you're going to arrive. That sounds like a Yogi Berra comment, doesn't it? I love Yogi Berra. It's as simple as that. Former NFL coach, by the way, I know the NFL season kicks off today. I'll try to have you out of here soon enough. But George Allen, y'all remember him? He was a coach for the Washington Redskins. He had a sign on his desk that said this. It's what I'm doing right now taking me closer to my ultimate goal of winning. Think about that. George Allen was constantly evaluating the direction that his actions and his decisions were taking him on a regular basis. Folks, we need to do the same thing. Each one of us, and people are not real good at this, most people, but each one of us needs to do a little self-evaluation. Do you ever do that when you look in the mirror? You just look yourself gut level and eye to eye and do some self-evaluation, critique yourself? We need to ask ourselves, if I continue on the path I'm on, where will it take me? In my marriage, in my relationships, in my work, in my health, in my spiritual life, in my eternal destination. Based on my current direction, where am I headed? You know, speaking about our country, we need to do the same thing. Our country needs to say, where are we headed? Folks, i got to be honest with you. I don't like the looks of where we're headed right now as a nation. I, I don't like the ultimate destination. In the days of Malachi, the people of Israel were not moving in the, in, in the direction of a harvest blessing either. In fact, they were headed the opposite way. And God spoke to them. In the first part of verse 7, it says, Ever since the time of your forefathers, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me. Oh, that we as a country would do that. That we would heed that warning. You see, direction determines destination. Thank God, though, you can change direction anytime you want. Even if you have been uh, going the wrong way for years and years and years, God say, come back to me. I, I, wait, I want you to come back to me. It's not too late. You can do it right now. Now, here's how this principle works for most Christians. And that's where I'll probably categorize uh, everybody here today. For many of us, 
It's not a matter of living in prolonged rebellion against God. Right? I mean, we, we don't just turn our back on God. Instead, this is what happens. It's a matter of taking one step forward, two steps back. Or two steps forward and one step back. And we find ourselves in many areas of our lives wandering off the path time and time again. Maybe it's just for a day or two or maybe it's just for a week or two. And the end result is that we're not moving consistently in the direction of God's harvest. That's the way it is for most of us. And when God says, return to me and I will return to you, he's saying this, move in my direction so that I can be present in your life. So that you can experience the abundant life in me. You know, for nine weeks, uh, we looked at the book of James, didn't we? As we talked about pandemic faith. What were, what were some of the important things that we learned from James? You remember one of those? Was having that time alone in God's word with him every day. Spending those moments in his presence. Can I let you in on a little secret? You can't be blessed by God when you're far away from God. It doesn't happen. You have to be in that close proximity. So this principle that direction determines determina uh, de determines destination is the same principle as the law of the harvest that Paul talked about. You remember Galatians 6? He said, do not be deceived. In other words, don't get fooled. Be on your toes. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. That's just what you call consequences. You know, if, if I'm driving down the road and I think, well, there's a cliff over here, I'm going to drive off this cliff and see what happens. I wouldn't be real smart doing that, okay? But if I drive off that cliff and halfway down, I may repent. I may go, you know, that was a bad decision. I really am sorry that I did that. God forgive me for making that bad decision. Guess what? Consequences still remain, don't they? I'm going to hit the ground. And it may, be the, may get a little bit ugly too. Probably will. But see, that's the way life is. Whatever you plant determines what you grow. Where you're headed determines where you go. So you need to ask yourself. Here's two good questions. We probably ought to ask ourselves every day of our life. What am I sowing in my life? Where am I going? In my, if you would ask somebody at work one day, Catch them at the water cooler and go, can I ask you a question? Where are you going in life? You'd blow them away, wouldn't you? You'd have people stutter and they would stammer around and go, well, I, you know, well, I live out in Harvest or I live in Newmarket or I live in South. I didn't ask you where you lived. I asked you, where are you going in life? So when you do this, you need to ask these questions. Is the way I treat my spouse is the way I speak to my children, taking us in the direction of becoming a family blessed by God. In my job, am I sowing the seeds of success? Am I moving in the direction of better health? Am I preparing the fields of my life for a harvest of abundance? You know, folks, every time I ask myself these questions, I hear, I hear God saying to me, now, Bobby, here's an area you need to work on. Here's an area you need to change. Because you've gotten off of the track here a little bit. And you need to come back to me. Return to me. So the principle of direction determines destination is a principle that you and I need to tweak every day of our lives. Constantly asking ourselves those questions. Where am I headed? Where am I going? What am I sowing? Now here's the second point I want to make to you. It's not just the fact that direction determines destination. But it's that your daily direction determines your ultimate destination. You see the difference there? There's a big difference. That's where a lot of people fail, uh, fail to experience the harvest in their life. And it's because of that one little word. You know what it is? Daily. That's the problem here. You know, most people have a, have a pretty good general idea of, of where they want to go, right? Everybody here want to go to heaven? Anybody here today not want to go to heaven? I don't see any hand. We all want to go to heaven, right? We, we've got a good idea about that. But if you were to take a snapshot of everybody's life, it would probably appear that they're at least facing the right direction. But here's where most of us get tripped up. The destination is not just about looking in the right direction. It's about daily progress, about moving, okay? It's not enough to be facing the right direction. 
Okay? Looking to the west. You actually have to be moving down the road, making progress every single day. I remember I had Coach Bruce Hanley, was assistant football coach when I was in high school. He was the head basketball coach. Back in the 70s, y'all remember long hair, don't you? Boy, I remember those. I remember those days. Coach Hanley wore a flat top haircut. I mean, he was just like a, a, an army drill sergeant. Well, I tell you what, he was a motivator. And if a guy wasn't moving fast enough on the football field, he would go, son, are you moving? He'd hold his thumb up to see if you were moving. He said, you need to get your armpits wet a little bit. In other words, you need to make some progress. You need to be moving in this right direction. It's not enough just to own a bunch of apple trees, folks. You got to work the fields. You got to get them ready. The apple harvest paid off big time for the apple orchard owner because every day of his life, he moved in the direction of the harvest. He didn't just buy a 100-acre orchard and say, well, you know, probably in the fall, those apples are going to start falling. It didn't happen that way. The apple harvest paid off because every day of his life, he moved in the direction of the harvest. He didn't work the fields just one day a week. He didn't wait until the middle of August and start pruning and irrigating in a mad scramble to try to get things ready for the last minute. Uh uh. Every day of his life, he moved in the direction of the harvest. So, for you and me, what we need to do in order to experience the harvest of blessing and abundance that God promises to his people is that we need to learn a lesson from Mr. Apple Worship. And what is that lesson? We need to make sure that in every area of our lives, we're moving in God's direction. That's the secret. Not just one day a week. Not just Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock. But on Mondays when you go to work and the guy cuts you off in traffic. And you want to say something. Or you want to think something. You want to have a, a, an ugly attitude toward that person. Listen, we are believers. We are followers of Christ. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, whatever situation that we're in, folks. Every day of our lives, in every area of our lives, we're to move in God's direction. Let me ask you, do you want to be blessed in your marriage? Then move in the direction of a God-centered marriage every day. Do you want to be healed? Do you want to be well? Then move in the direction of good health every day. Do you want to experience a harvest of financial uh, of abundance? Then every day move in the direction of better money management. Do you want to grow in your Christian life? Then every day spend time alone with God. As I mentioned earlier a while ago, we spent nine weeks in James, and one of the things we talked about was spending time with God. I hope you've taken advantage of this virus. I hope you've had more time to be in God's Word and a time of prayer every day. So the key phrase in all these things is this, every day. Your daily direction determines your ultimate destination. If you're always moving one step forward and one step back, and one step to the right, and one step to the left, guess what? You haven't made any progress. You're still at the same spot, right? And you will never arrive at your desired destination. But if you work the fields every day, if you're moving forward every day, then your harvest will come. Because that's why Paul says, let us not grow weary in what? Doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. I've known so many people through the years who've walked an aisle in the church and even got dunked in the baptistry and there was no change in their life. I mean, there were no fruit uh, that was revealed in their life of having a relationship with Jesus Christ. I, I, I'm not their judge. I'm just telling you what I've seen, what I've observed. But it's a matter of growing in Christ-likeness every single day of our life. Now, there's one more aspect of this journey to the harvest principle that I want you to see today, okay? Then I'm going to turn you loose. Number three, you ready? Your ultimate destination is always a little bit closer than it used to be. Woo! Did you know that today you're closer to heaven than you were yesterday this time? That's sober again. You know, every day I get up and I put my feet on the floor, I'm thankful. Because I think, one day I may not wake up and put my feet on the floor. They may haul me on a, on a gurney to the funeral home, and that's it. That's over. But we are one, close, one step closer to the Lord. Notice what God says. Return to me. Now, this is important. Return to me, and I will return to you. Do you know what one of the best promises is in all of Scripture? Now, they're all good, but this is one of the best of them. When you move towards God, guess what happens? He moves toward you. Malachi said it here. 
James said it in the New Testament in chapter 4 verse 8. Come near to God and he will come near to you. God, God wants us to make that move and then he meets us halfway. He meets us halfway. So when you begin to draw near to him, he doesn't hide. He doesn't say, you know, I'm going to go play hide and seek right now. He doesn't backpedal. He starts moving in your direction. In fact, the Bible says that he runs in your direction. What do you, God runs? Look at, what, gee, you remember the story of the prodigal son? Y'all need your head if you're awake. Okay, prodigal son, after he had run away from home and after he had wasted his father's fortune on wild living in a foreign land, guess what? He made the decision, personal decision. You know, I got to go home. And his hope was to be accepted at home by his father as an employee, as a servant. And Jesus said this about the father. This is from Luke chapter 15, verse 20. While he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. Now, when children are small, when they're one or two years of age, they don't mind being kissed, do they? But when they're 13 or 14, oh, you both mom and dad, don't kiss them, especially in public. You know, that, that's humiliating. This father showered his love upon this wayward son. Folks, listen, we don't serve a God who that stands far off in the distance while we stumble our way back to him. We serve a God that meets us halfway. What a God he is. There, uh, one man shares a story. He says, I grew up in Oklahoma where we have a saying that if you don't like the weather, just wait five minutes. Probably a lot like here in Alabama, isn't it? Well, he says, one fairly sunny morning, I left for school, and I was about six years of age, and I dressed in my short sleeve shirt, and I had on my light cardigan sweater. But during the day, the weather turned cold, bitterly cold. He said, when the school bell rang, I headed for home. Now, this was back in the 60s when kids could walk home alone uh, without being uh, fearful of being abducted. He says, it, I began the four-block trek to my house, and it was so cold. My hands felt like they were, were ice cubes. And then he admits this. He says, I'm not particularly proud of this part of the story, but I started to cry. Six years old, I was freezing. He said, it was only a four-block walk, but it seemed like it was miles, and I was all by myself, and I was so cold, and I was shivering. And then he says, an amazing thing happened. I looked up, and there was my mom. She met me at the halfway point of coming home. And she brought my hat, she brought my coat, and she brought my gloves. He said, now normally my mom would have been at work that day, but for some reason she was home that afternoon, and she realized that the weather had turned so much colder and it had been that morning, and she knew that I hadn't worn my coat that day. So she came to me. And the guy says, soon the tears began to dry up and they went away and my hands got a little warm. He says, that always is a, is a wonderful memory in my heart. He says, by the way, I, I usually don't cry when it gets cold now. But folks, I want to tell you something. We have a God that meets us halfway. And when you return to Him, He returns to you. When you draw near to Him, He draws near to you. When you move in His direction, He moves in your direction. The harvest of blessing that God has promised us doesn't keep getting put off it doesn't get pushed back. It doesn't get postponed. Because when you move towards God, the harvest gets on the fast track forward. Because we have a God that meets us halfway. You see, God has, a prom has promised a harvest for all his people. So then, Galatians 6, 9, Let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. So how do you make sure that your harvest ready? Well, you begin by sowing what you want to reap. You begin by moving in the direction that you want to go. And you do it every single day. Every day you move in the direction of the harvest. That means you draw near to God. Let me ask you very personally, do you want to harvest a blessing in your marriage? Do you? Then you move your marriage in God's direction. Do you want God to bless you financially? Then you move your financial priorities in God's direction. Do you want to be blessed at work? Then you move your work ethic in God's direction. And every day you move in that direction, he moves in your direction. Your life will no longer then be one step forward and two steps back. Instead, it will be one step forward and two steps closer to the harvest of God's blessing. You see, your direction determines your destination. And when we put this into practice, folks, our daily life helps us to become harvest ready. Two questions, and I'm done. Number one, let me ask you. In which direction are you headed? Be honest. Are you going toward God 
or toward hell. You can turn around today. Second, and this is probably where most of us are, if you're headed in that direction, if you're pointed in the direction toward God, are you moving toward Him? That's how our heads. Maybe you're here today, and you know in your heart of hearts that you do not know Jesus Christ. I've got the best news you'll ever hear. You can trust Him today to be your Lord and Savior. Would you do that this morning? We're going to have a hymn of invitation. We're not going to move, but we're going to just remain in our seats, and Carl's going to play quietly, no singing. But if you have a decision to make this morning, particularly to trust Jesus Christ, would you just lift up your hand? If you raise your hand this morning, after everyone's gone, I'd like to talk with you privately and talk with you about what the Bible says about turning to Christ. If you'll do that in a moment, we begin to prepare the music. But maybe you're here today and you already know Christ, but you're not moving. You're just pointed in the right direction. You're not making any progress. And you get so frustrated and sometimes even confused as to why you're not growing in your Christian life. Maybe you're not moving in that direction. And maybe you need to recommit your life to, to Him today, to renew that relationship. Just to say, Lord, I, I am your child, but I've been disobedient. I've been stagnant. I've been doing my own thing. I haven't been seeking you in each and everything. Maybe you'd like to make that decision, Lord. Just slip up your hand as well. Carl's going to play right now. If there's anyone here this morning who needs to make a decision, would you just lift up your hand as he plays? Simply, quietly, just make that decision. There's no one else looking around. Just myself. I'm going to talk with you. Anyone at all. Anyone at all. I want to move in God's direction. I want to be harvested. Ready. God's people. And I pray that each and every one of us here this morning will be moving in that direction to be harvest ready. Lord, we realize one day there is going to be a great harvest where you're, you come back, Lord, and you call home your bride. And the church, the followers of Jesus Christ, will leave this world to enter into heaven. Father, I pray that each and every one of us here today is ready. And I pray that this week we'll be influencers not the ones being influenced, but to be influencers, to be salt and light in a world that is rotting around us. Help us to have the courage. Help us to be obedient to what you've called us to do. Lord Jesus, we love you. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Thank you for being here this morning. God bless you. Say a good word about Jesus. Say a good word about our fellowship. So good to see so many of you here today. Be safe as you go out. Have a good week, and uh, God bless you.